The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents George Brent in Burma Surgeon. DuPont's better things for better living have become vital materials of war. For instance, the nylon yarn, which in peacetime was made into sheer, long-wearing hosiery, is today used exclusively for war purposes. And the strong, durable Cordura rayon yarn, used in peacetime in the manufacture of sturdy truck and bus tires, is today being used in tires for army rolling equipment and in all important parachutes for flares, cargo and fragmentation bombs. When peace comes... These and scores of other DuPont products will return to all as still better, better things for better living. This evening, the Cavalcade of America brings you a story out of the native villages, the swamps and jungles of Burma. A story of 20 years of a man's life devoted to teaching and healing. Here is a tale of sacrifice suddenly brought to life by the flames of war. Our play, written by Milton Wayne and Robert Richards, is based on the current bestseller, Burma Surgeon, by Dr. Gordon S. Seagrave. Cavalcade is proud to present Burma Surgeon, starring George Brent as Dr. Gordon S. Seagrave. last echoes of the ill-starred Battle of Burma have died. The heroic, heartbreaking retreat of General Stilwell and his men through the Burma jungle is over. It is May 1942, and at a casualty station at the little town of Impal on the border of India, the last of the wounded are straggling in for treatment. Americans and British, Burmese, Chinese, Indians, veterans of Burma. Bring that man right over here. Doctor, we through pretty soon. Have you been examined yet, Lieutenant? Not yet. No great hurry, though. Where are you wounded? Here. Leg. Shell fragment, I think. <gasps> Here, I say, what are you doing there? I am cleaning up your wound before the doctor comes. Well, you better wait for a nurse or someone like that, eh? I am a nurse, Lieutenant. Orderly, dressings in a sterile probe, please. Yes, nurse. You're a, a nurse? Yes. Is it strange to you because I am in dirty overalls and have no pretty white uniform? Well... No, I'm used to that, you know, but... You're, you're a native, aren't you? I mean... I am a native of Burma, yes. You are a native of England, are you not? <sighs> when you put it that way, yes, I suppose I am. Sulfur powder and put it in the cast. Well, what's the matter with this man? A shell fragment in the leg, Doctor. Any evidence of fracture? I don't find any. I'll probe for the fragment and then dress the wound. You can do it as well as I can. Yes, sir. Now, who's next here? This man over here, sir. What sort of a place is this? Who in the world is that chap? That is Dr. Seagrave. Well, really, now, even a doctor from Burma doesn't go around in nothing but a pair of shorts and a layer of sweat. This doctor does, when it is hot, and when his clothes have all been soaked with the blood of men who fought for freedom. Attention. Oh, good Lord, General Stillwell. No, don't try to stand. As you were, as you were. Well, Dr. Seagrave, still growing strong, I see, eh? Huh? And the best we can. Better order a transfusion on this man right away. Yes, sir. I just want to say to you again that you and your Burmese girls were great on that march to the jungle. A lot of us wouldn't have made it without you. Oh, without you, General, so I guess that makes us even. I'll operate on him as soon as you're ready. Very good, sir. When I see you beat this, I'll leave you alone. Anything you want? Same old thing. Food, medical supplies. We never seem to have enough. Well, I'm doing what I can. I know. I'll give you a more thorough report when I'm clear. Right. Thanks again. So that's Dr. Sigre. I told you. You would not believe. Well, I'm awfully sorry, really, but... It's not usual, you know. I'm Burmese nurses. This chap, Seagrave... He's a wonder, I hear. Then I will tell you something about Dr. Seagrave. Because when I probe for the fragment in your leg, it will hurt. And perhaps what I tell you will take your mind off the pain. Shall I? Yes, do. <laughs> oh. You are going to hurt me, aren't you? Yes. Let me tell you about Dr. Seagrave. Go on. It was a long time ago. 
long before the war. And I was only a little girl when Dr. Seagrave came to our village in Burma. We did not know much of Americans or Europeans then. There was only one in the village. And our people did not like him very well. His name was Mr. Simpson. He was a trader. I see. Dr. Seagrave came with his young wife. They did not know quite what to expect, especially poor Mrs. Seagrave. She had believed we would receive her and her husband with gratitude. But that was not what happened. Hello there. You Seagrave? Why, uh, yes, and this is Mrs. Seagrave. How do you do? How do you do? I'm Simpson. You never heard of me, I suppose. Well, as a matter of fact... It's no matter, it's no matter. I heard of you, though. I heard you were coming. Well, come along. I'll show you your new setup. Thanks. I'm certainly glad somebody knows about it. Oh, they know, all right. They? Yeah, the natives. They knew before I did. I don't know how. They're a suspicious lot, though. Suspicious? Of what? Of a white man. That's why you don't see any of them. But they're cooking up some kind of reception for you all the same. What kind of a reception? It's hard to say. But you'll find out soon enough, though. Some way to make you lose face. Some way to embarrass you. I'm sorry, but I don't believe that. Well, suit yourself. You'll know what I mean when you've been here a little while. Well, maybe if they'd been treated a little better. There's only one way to treat these people. Tell them what you want done and make them do it. It's all a matter of face here. Well, here's your establishment. Where? Right in front of you. Your hospital. That shack? Well, I hope you didn't expect to find a miniature Johns Hopkins. <laughs> uh, that's your house next door. It's not too bad. We can make you fairly comfortable here. Well, let's take a look inside the uh, hospital. Uh, there's not much to see. Here you are. There. A few wooden beds. That's about all. Mm, pretty dirty, isn't it? Everything out here is dirty. Gordon, look, there's our luggage. Ah, they must have brought it up here. Must want you to have it handy. No uh, patients, of course. <laughs> you thought the lame, the halt, and the blind would all be waiting for you, did you? Nah, nah. They go to their own doctors, these people, if you can call them that. Which doctors would be much better? Well, they're certainly starting from scratch. Listen, uh, what's that? Ah, uh, I thought they'd be up to something. Come on, let's have a look. Looks like a parade of the whole village. What's that they're chanting? It's a sort of prayer for the dying. Oh, look, that must be it. It's a funeral. They're carrying someone. Uh, there's more behind it than that. They're turning in here to the hospital. Oh. Oh, so that's it, huh? Hello! Do any of them speak English? Some of them. Now, look, this is the trick, Seagrave. I'm warning you. Now, suppose you let me handle this. I've got a sick man there. That's obvious. Who can speak English? I can speak English. Well, what's the matter? You are American doctor? Yes, Dr. Seagrave. Man here, very sick. I see. Now, let's have a look. This man? This man. Good Lord, the fellow's half dead. What's the matter with him? Hmm. Peritonitis. Ruptured appendix, probably. Oh. But it must have happened days ago. He's, he's full of infection by now. Is there a chance? Oh, half a chance. If we operate right away. They'll never let you operate. Never in the world. Look, this man is dying. I know. But I may be able to save his life if I operate on him right away. What is this operate? Well, I, I have to cut him open, take the poison out, then I sew him up again. You understand? All right. You operate. Will you give the anesthetic, Tiny? All right. Now, look, Seagrave, don't be a fool. There isn't time to boil anything. We'll have to sterilize and scrub with alcohol. There's a big bottle in that carton, I think. Yes, I'll get everything ready. Instruments and gloves, that's all. All right, take them inside. Uh, now, for heaven's sake, Seagrave, are you crazy? No, I'm merely a doctor. But don't you see what this whole thing is? It's a trick. I told you it was. The man's all but dead right now. You can't save him. Probably not, but there's a chance. And he certainly won't live if I don't try. He won't live anyway, and when he dies, they'll blame you, and that'll be the end of you. It's simply a trick of the local witch doctor to make you lose face. Well, I guess I'll just have to lose a little, then. Well, lose as much as you like. I'm not thinking about you. I'm thinking about white prestige all over this province. Now, look, Simpson, let's get one thing straight. I don't give a hoot for prestige in any race. I came out here to save lives, or try to, and I'm starting right now. Oh. 
So you're one of those fellas, That's you? right. Ever see an operation? Come on in. You might learn something. In fact, you might be able to help. Yeah. Almost ready, Tani? Yes, all ready. Here's your alcohol for scrubbing. Thanks. How is he? You'd better hurry. Hmm. Find any gloves? Here you are. Better put some on yourself. You'll have to help. All right. And start the anesthetic. Where is he? Where is he? Well, who are you? Who am I? Who are you? What are you doing to my father? Well, if you mean that man there, I, I'm going to make him well again. If I can. No. No, I heard what they are saying. You are going to cut him open like a pig. Well, I'm going to cut him open, but hardly like a pig. No, you will not. He shall die in peace at least. You will not. Gordon. Go on with the anesthetic, honey. Don't you touch him. Don't you dare to touch him. Simpson, will you explain that I can't him. operate unless they get that girl out of here? All right. Hold up. Hold up. Gordon. Is he under yet? Yes. Gordon. Perhaps we shouldn't. Scalpel, please, Tani. Here you are. Watch his pulse. Is there adrenaline handy? I've laid it out. Clamp, please. Another, please. How is he? Pulse is weak, but steady. And if he can hang on a little longer, I'll, I'll have him open a couple of seconds. Retractor, please. There we are. Sponge, please. Another. Better hand me one of those towels. How is he? Still steady. You see, Lieutenant, this girl, her name was Ahala, she was what you call a very spirited girl. Did she was? At first, she, she hated Dr. Seagrave for what she thought he had done to her father. And when her father got better, she would go in to see him only when the doctor was not there. But she was very curious, too, about this American doctor. Oh? And one day, when he was working in a part of the hospital, he had made into a laboratory. Well. Oh. Hello there, my little Spitfire. I did not know you were here. Didn't you? Well, come in anyway. What is this Spitfire? It's a young lady who needs an operation on her temper. You will not operate on me. Oh, don't worry. How is your father? I don't know. He eats a great deal. He will probably die soon. You don't really think that, do you? What is the magic that you have to make the dying live? It must be a very wicked magic. No, not magic. It's something called science. Science? What is this science? Science? Well, it's, um... It's just knowing the right way to do a thing so that... So that what you want to have happen does happen. Oh, this is nothing. My people also have this. Do they? Well, what do they do for your father? Oh, the doctor made many strong spells... And gave much strong medicine made from the oil of a snake. But it didn't do your father much good, did it? Oh, he was very sick. But what I did made him well. Oh, not because I'm any better than your people. But because I had science. You see? If that is all, why does not everyone learn this science? Because it is very hard and takes a very long time. And some people just don't have that kind of a mind. Some people simply don't have the time. Then a woman could not learn it. Oh, yes. <laughs> Many women have learned it. But a woman of Burma, like me, she could not learn it. She could try. She could learn it if she wanted to enough. Dr. Seagrave. Yes, Ayala. I want to learn your science. I want that more than anything in the world. Do you, Ayala? Oh, yes. Well, why do you? To help my people. Oh, but, but perhaps that is not a great enough reason. It's the finest reason anyone could ever have. Ayala, I wanted to hear that. You will teach me? Oh, I, I will be your servant. I will work day and night. Oh, you won't have to do that. Then what must I do? Tell me. Well, you must learn to be patient and kind to those who are sick. You must learn to do the most humble tasks and do them cheerfully. And you must learn not to tremble at the sight of pain. And yet, you must feel that pain as though it were your own. You must learn to do many things that will be unpleasant to you, that will sicken you. And yet, never show your feelings to those you serve. Do you think you can learn all those things? Yes, Dr. Seagrave. I promise you I will learn. You 
are listening to Burma Surgeon, starring George Brent as Dr. Gordon Seagrave on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. As our play continues, a young Burmese nurse is telling a wounded soldier how Seagrave came to Burma and how he struggled to overcome the suspicion and prejudice he found there. His first step toward success was to interest a group of Burmese girls to become nurses. That was how Dr. Seagrave started his school for Burmese nurses, Lieutenant. At first, there was only Ahala. Then others joined. I myself joined. Good for you. As the years passed, we built a new hospital, even a nurse's home in the midst of the Burma jungle. And then... Then came the terrible years of war. The Burma Road was being built right past our village, and so we were all doubly concerned. But of course. We got most of our news by radio. One afternoon, the doctor and some others were listening to the radio at the hospital. It was confirmed in Allied headquarters that the Japanese have launched an extensive drive into Burma. Although no details have been officially revealed, it was reliably reported that the Japanese had already crossed the Burma border in several places and had made advance up to as much as eight miles. The first objective of any such drive would, of course, be to cut the famous Burma Road, which supplies are carried to the armies. I guess it's true, all right, Simpson. Well, it had to come sooner or later. The Burma Road. That sort of puts us right in the line of fire, doesn't it? Do you think we're really in danger? Not from the Japanese, not yet. Your worst danger is right here at home. What do you mean? I mean from the Burmese themselves. Why, once they've seen that the Japs are actually strong enough to march into Burma, they'll desert to them like flies. Oh, nonsense. Oh, I know some of them have been taken in by this Asia for the Asiatic stuff, but most of them see right through it. Oh, you think so, eh? I suppose you think these little Burmese nurses of yours won't streak over to the Japanese the first chance they get. Why, I'd bet my life on it that they wouldn't. <laughs> all right, all right. But the first good demonstration of powers the Japs put on, goodbye nurses. Listen, what's that? Planes. I don't suppose there could be... Something tells me here's your demonstration of power, Dr. Seagrave. They're Japs. Come on. Tiny, you go down to the shelter and hurry. Well, Gordon, where are you going? I'm going to warn the nurses in the ward. Uh, hello, Coy, all of you, listen. Yes, Doctor. There are Japanese planes coming over. I want you to all go down to the air raid shelter right away. You understand? Yes, yes Doctor. Now, hurry. Doctor, who is to stay with the patients? I'm going to stay with the patients. Now, hurry. Then we also will stay. You will not. Now go down to that shelter as I told you. Very well, we will go. And hurry. You better go too, Simpson. Oh, I don't mind staying here. Never seen a real air raid before. Yes, suit yourself. Here they come. Now, 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 now. Everybody be calm. We're going to be all right. This is a hospital and they wouldn't bomb that. Who are you trying to fool? Well, I just want to prevent any panic, that's all. They're bombing the road. Yeah, it sounds that way. Oh, I wonder how many of those poor devils out there working on it will be in the hospital tonight. There'll be enough. That was close. Well, either they're missing the road or they're trying to hit us. It sounds as though they're moving off. Yeah. Well, I guess the worst is over. All right, everyone. It's over now. You can relax. I guess I better go and find Tiny. She'll be wondering where I was. Yeah, here she comes now. Oh, hello there, darling. You all right? Oh, yes, I'm all right. Where were you? Up here. Oh, Gordon. How did the girls take it? The girls? Oh, yes. Weren't they with you? Oh, no. <laughs> I told you. That's the last you'll see of them. I don't believe it. You're sure they weren't down there with you, Tiny? No, no, not one of them. Well, where could they have gone? I... Listen, what's that? Sounds like someone shouting. Huh? Probably better have a look. They are of the same race, the same blood. They do not wish to destroy us. It is only the white men they wish to destroy. I hate to say I told you so, Seagrave. Gordon, Gordon, he's got a gun from somewhere. I don't like the looks they of this, Seagrave. They want to help us to free ourselves from the slavery of the white man. That is why they drop death from the skies upon our lands. Because we harbor the white men who are their enemies as well as ours. Isn't that one of your little nurses in the crowd there? Why, it's Ella. No, she is coming through the crowd. Dr. Seagrave. Well, where have you been? Don't be angry. We went to be near the wounded. We hid in a ditch until it was over. The others are bringing the wounded in now. Oh. But what is happening here? What is that man saying? What you hear? Stop, you fool, you stupid, stupid fool. What are you saying? There is hardly a man or woman in all this province who has not been helped by this American. You... Give me that rifle. 
Give it to me. Now go. Go. And never let us hear you again bring such shame upon our people. Oh, Dr. Seagrave, I am so ashamed for him. Never mind him, eh, hello. I think we owe you some thanks. We were bombed many times, Lieutenant. The wounded from the fighting front came to our hospital by the hundreds. Chinese, Americans, English, Indians. All those brave men who were fighting to hold on a little longer. And we were almost too busy to think of what would happen to us. It's very brave of you. Then, then at last the order came. We must leave. We must get across the border into India as best we could. We were to march with General Stilwell. I see. We had to leave on short notice, and, and everything was confusion as we loaded what we could into army ambulances for the first part of the journey. What do you want these instruments, Doctor? But them anywhere you can find room. You haven't seen Ahala, have you? Oh, no, sir, I haven't touched it. We are almost ready, Doctor. Be with you in a minute. I'm trying to find Ahala. I haven't seen her this morning. Find enough. Oh. There you are, Ahala. I was just going through the operating room to see if you had left anything. Better join the other girls. They're all ready to go. And the patients? Well, we've put as many as we could into the ambulances. Only the worst cases. How many will be left? Nearly a hundred. Oh, Ahala, that makes me sick. Sick to think of leaving those men behind. What's to become of them? Who's to take care of them? They will be cared for among my people. Oh, but they need so much more. Some of them still need medical attention. I'd give anything in the world to stay here with them. Well, you must go with the armies. That is your place. I know, I know. But are you sure your people can hide them from the Japs? Take care of them? Oh, yes. I am very, very sure. What do you mean? I mean I'm sure because I'm going to stay here with them. Stay here with them? Well, you can't do that. Well, yes, I can, and I must. Oh, no, you can't. I forbid it. You know what the Japs are like. Please, this is my place. This is where I will stay. It's my place if it's anyone. No, it is only where we can serve the most. You are needed with the armies, and I'm needed here. Do not be afraid. I am afraid. I won't let you... Dr. Seagrave, you know what I am doing is right, because it is you who have taught me these things, to perform the humble tasks, the unpleasant tasks. Well, you have taught us so much that your people and, and my people can trust each other and work together and serve each other. And... So many things that I cannot say. That is why I am staying. It is what you yourself would do. I'm going to miss you, Ahala. Oh, I shall miss you, but I shall be here when you come back. And we will come back. I shall be waiting. And these men, these fighting men, they will be waiting too. Dr. Seagrave, convoy's ready to start, sir. I'll be there in a minute. Yes, sir. Goodbye, my dear doctor. Goodbye, Ahala. Oh, look, there's one more thing you will need. The pail from the operating room. Oh, it is half filled with blood. The blood of Asia. Pour it here on the ground and mark the place, Ahala. One day free men shall spring from this earth and from this blood. Thank you, George Brent. DuPont is glad to have had the privilege of bringing to Cavalcade's audience this story of one who serves his country better because he first served humanity. Mr. Brent will return to the microphone in a few moments. Meanwhile, here is Gain Whitman with news which gives us added confidence that the Army Medical Corps, with the help of chemistry, is making the American Army the healthiest in the history of our country. Throughout history, disease has followed armies. Typhus has been the soldier's worst enemy, far worse than bullets. In the Crusades and again in Napoleon's day, typhus killed soldiers by the tens of thousands and spread from the armies to the civilian population. During World War I, there were at least 10 million known cases of typhus in Europe, with 5 million deaths. In this war, the United States Army has already won an overwhelming victory over disease. Among all our soldiers in China, Burma, and India... There has been only one case of typhus. There has been not one case of cholera, tetanus, or smallpox. 
In the whole of North Africa and the Middle East, our men have suffered only four mild cases of typhus with no deaths. The shot-in-the-arm inoculations that our soldiers and sailors get aren't fun. Nobody enjoys them. But such a splendid health record is worth any number of inoculations. In addition to inoculations, food is checked, and food handlers are constantly inspected. The armor purifies all drinking water by boiling it, or killing the germs with chlorine. Insects and vermin, because typhus is carried by lice and fleas, are controlled with other chemical compounds like DuPont's IN-930. High praise must go to the doctors and nurses of the medical corps, who have achieved a miracle of health in the midst of battle. Their courage, their wisdom, their prompt acceptance of new life-saving techniques, such as the blood bank, are deserving of the greatest praise. Credit must go also to the manufacturers of medicinal compounds, who are supplying drugs of the highest purity to the armed forces in vast quantities called for by more than 60 different fighting fronts the longest battle line in the history of war. It has always been a source of gratification to the DuPont Company that many of the compounds used in medicine have been developed from materials created by industrial chemistry. The marvelous sulfur drugs, for instance, which have accomplished so much for civilian as well as military medicine and surgery, grew out of research in dyes. The shelves of DuPont laboratories with their hundreds of bottles of new compounds with long names have supplied many a research worker in medicine with the materials needed for his experiments. Saving lives in time of war is one of the duties of the products of industrial chemistry that serve you in time of peace as DuPont, better things for better living through chemistry. And now here is George Brent, star of this evening's cavalcade, to ask your help in a real emergency. George Brent. And that emergency, ladies and gentlemen, is this. At a time when the government needs great quantities of packaging paper, many American paper mills face a shutdown for lack of waste paper. Waste paper reprocessed packages food and shells. It makes parachute flares, bomb fins, practice bombs, wing kites and camouflage paper and many other civilian and military items. So bundle up your old newspapers and magazines and watch your newspaper for local salvage directions. Get every scrap of waste paper into production for victory. Thank you. Next Monday evening, Cavalcade will bring you two of Hollywood's favorites, James Craig and Beulah Bondi, in Joe Dyer Ends a War. Our play, A Lesson for the Post-War World from the Pages of America's Past, One Answer to the Age-Old Hope for Lasting Peace, is an exciting story of a dispute between the people of Connecticut and the people of Pennsylvania that almost led to war a century and a half ago. DuPont invites you to join Cavalcade's audience again next Monday evening when we present James Craig and Beulah Bondi in an exciting drama that happened in the early days of our republic and has a parallel in today's news. Our play is called Joe Dyer Ends a War. Acknowledgement is made to Alfred Knopf, publisher of Jack Belden's Retreat with Stillwell, for permission to quote from that book. Tonight's musical score was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. This is James Bannon sending best wishes from Cavalcade sponsor, the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. The Cavalcade of America comes to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.